Our passage this morning that God is going to speak to us from is Luke chapter 1, starting at verse 1 and ending at verse 25. Les is going to read out God's word to us, and then after he's done that, Mark will teach us from the passage. Thanks, Les. Good morning. Yes, the reading is Luke chapter 1, verses 1 to 25. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time, to write an orderly account for you, most ex excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. Now while he was serving as priest before God, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on his right side at the, altar, at the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go... Be and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. And Zechariah said to the angel, how shall, this, how shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife is advanced in years. And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. And I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. And the people were waiting for Zechariah, and they were wondering at his delay in the temple. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them and they realised that he had seen a vision in the temple. And he kept making signs to them and remained mute. And when his time of service has ended, he went to his home. After these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, please turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 1 if they're not there already and uh, there's a space for you to uh, write down um, any notes today. Well, welcome again to church and welcome again to Luke's Gospel, uh, which is a gospel of hope. Uh, human beings must have hope. Uh, the opposite of hope, of course, is hopelessness. Uh, there's only one alternative to hope, and that is hopelessness. But Christians believe that there is hope, and hope is found in a name, and that name is Jesus. 
I wonder whether you ever suggest to someone to read the Gospel of Luke as the first part of the Bible to read. If you have a friend or a family member who's not a Christian, is the Gospel of Luke the first part of the scriptures that you would recommend? If that's the choice that you make, uh, that you that you make, then that's a pretty good uh, place to go to as a first part of the Bible. Uh, Luke is a great place to introduce people about Jesus. You might remember back in 2009, the great Connect 09 campaign. Hundreds of thousands of Luke's Gospels, essential Jesuses, remember, uh, were delivered to households uh, around Sydney and Wollongong and the Blue Mountains, including here at Sylvania, you might recall, uh, because uh, Luke's Gospel is a message of hope. It's a message of hope for a sinful world that you and I live in. It's a personal message, God's personal message, his letter, if you like, to our world about Jesus. But when Luke writes, he writes the truth with a particular objective in mind. It's truth with a purpose. Truth in order to bring people to trust in Jesus the Saviour and Lord. You see, if I said to you, 10 plus 10 equals 20, that is the truth. And it would be very helpful if I was teaching you mathematics. Okay? But thankfully, I'm not teaching you mathematics today. Right? The truth that Luke is on about is the truth about God and his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And the objective of that truth is to create trust in the hearts of people. Because you and I know that our world is a very uncertain world. We deal with constant uncertainty. Uh, during this week, I've had a minimum of, of two very significant uncertain events in my life that have happened. One of them was uh, Jack Whittaker uh, dying yesterday. Um, but uh, I think each week, uh, nothing goes to plan for me, I think, would be a good way of putting it. Some weeks are smoother than others, but uh, nothing ever goes exactly to plan because we live in an uncertain world. And what makes matters worse is that when it comes to spiritual things, our world has all sorts of different alternatives that it likes to offer up to uh, create a sort of a false hope uh, in a desperate bid to give some stability or balance in our lives. Now, when it comes to the most critical thing, God and how we have a relationship with him, Luke wants us to be certain about the truth so that we place our trust nowhere else or in no one else than Jesus. Notice the unique way, it's a very unique way, that Luke begins his gospel. No other gospel begins like this. Have a look at uh, Luke chapter 1, verse, verse 1. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. Now, Theophilus, by the way... Um, we don't know exactly who he was, but Luke writes to Theophilus. Theophilus is a, is a name that means friend of or lover of God. That's what Theophilus means. He may have been the financial patron of Luke to enable him to actually uh, publish his gospel. Or it could have been uh, simply a, 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 a spiritual friend, a, Christian, a fellow Christian disciple. We don't know much about Theophilus, but we do know a lot more about Luke Luke, the, the writer of the third gospel, is a very significant figure in the New Testament, although he stands in the background, background most of the time. We know several things about Luke the evangelist. We know that he was a follower of Jesus. Okay, He was a disciple of Jesus, not one of the first disciples of Jesus, but he was a follower of Jesus. Second thing we know is that he didn't look like that. Okay, He didn't look like that. The third thing that we know is that he was a close missionary partner with the Apostle Paul. So he followed the Apostle Paul on a number of his missionary journeys. Number four, Luke was a doctor. 
And scholars have actually gone through Luke's writings and they've identified something like 400 medical references in the writings of Luke. Subtle medical references and not all that subtle uh, that Luke incorporates within his writings. He was a doctor. Because he was a doctor, he was highly educated. And uh, for those who have studied theology and have, who have studied uh, the, um, uh, the New Testament in the Greek language, and there's a few of us here, Les Spratt and, and uh, my dear friend Pat over there, myself and Adam and others, um, you'll know that Luke's Gospel is a very refined type of Greek. Um, it's, it's not good to go into, into our Greek exam and have Luke's Gospel as the passage you've got to translate because you've, you've really got to be across your Greek because Luke was a highly educated, highly refined, stylistic writer. Okay? Um, very educated man. One of the things that also surprises Christians about Luke is that Luke wrote most of the New Testament. Did you know that? He wrote more of the New Testament than any other writer. The Apostle Paul wrote more books of the New Testament, but his books were quite small often. In terms of volume of words, Luke contributes, humanly speaking, 27% of the New Testament in his Gospel and in his sequel called the Acts of the Apostles. So can you see how Luke is a really significant character in the New Testament but he's behind the scenes but he has a massive part to play in, in God's work. But last but not least Luke was all those things but he was also an historian. He was an, an, an historian. Um, and so that's why when I did the HSC back in 1981, I studied the Acts of the Apostles for my HSC. Because the HSC, you could back in 1981, study the Acts of the Apostles because it was regarded as by the Board of Studies in New South Wales as an historical document. Right? And of course, most scholars worth their credibility uh, still regarded as very much an historical document along with the gospel. Luke writes about real events in real time, in real space. He's not writing a fairy tale. He's not writing a myth or a legend. He's writing a message not only to Theophilus, but he's writing a message to you and to me. So notice uh, in these verses that he opens up the gospel with um, certain things about himself as and historian comes to the fore. So notice in verse 3, his method. In verse 3, his methodology. He says in verse 3, having followed all things closely for some time past. So Luke has actually conducted investigations. He's a detective of history. He's had interviews with people. Um, don't forget, Luke wrote the Acts of the Apostles. And who's one of the people, one of the disciples in, in Acts that is part of the early Christian church? Mary, the mother of Jesus. So it's highly likely that Luke interviewed Mary about the events that he's going to talk about or write about in the next couple of chapters. He's talked to a whole range of eyewitnesses about Jesus and what he did in his earthly ministry. That's the methodology he investigates. But notice his content in verse 1. Many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us. Now that word accomplished is really, really important because it distinguishes between fake news okay, and true news between fake news and what is fact. The word accomplished is used in Luke's Gospel to speak of Jesus fulfilling everything that the Old Testament anticipates. Luke doesn't want to impose his own agenda on Jesus. He wants us to understand that Jesus is the fulfilment of the Old Testament. But notice also Luke's goal in verse 4. He says that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. 
that you may have cert certainty concerning the things you have been taught. Now that word certainty is a really important word for Luke. It, is, it summarises his whole objective. Um, in the Acts of the Apostles, it crops up quite a number of times. So, for example, in Acts chapter 16, when Paul and Silas are in prison in Philippi, they're in the stocks, and the word that Luke uses to, to describe how Paul and Silas are secure, securely imprisoned, is this word, certainty. When Paul, in his defence before different authorities in Acts chapters 25 and 26, he uses the word certainty to, to illustrate or to emphasise the definiteness of his facts about Jesus. Certainty is what Luke is seeking to achieve in the readers of his gospel. Now, during the week, uh, I don't know whether you find this helpful, but I, I, I'm a, often a, I'm a very visual person, and so I put together this little diagram. I hope it might be helpful for you. Many years ago, I was taught that a gospel is a narrative, a history, and a theology. Or to put it in one sentence, a gospel is a narrative of historic, of theologically significant historical events. A gospel is a narrative of theologically important historical events. Now Luke synthesises these together. He's writing a narrative. He's not writing a newspaper article. He's not writing an email. He's not sending an SMS. He's writing a narrative. He's writing a story. And when you write a story, you really want to engage the readers. Okay? So you'll notice that um, Luke loves narrative so much that he actually incorporates narratives within his narrative, like we saw last week with the parable of the sower. It's a story within the story of Luke's gospel. So narrative is one aspect of Luke's gospel. The other thing, though, is to realise that it's not fiction. It is history. It's historical narrative. Real time, real, pe real people, real places. So it's a story, true story. Okay? But thirdly, and very importantly, it's also theologically significant. It's not just any history. It's not just any story. It's a historical story about God and his son Jesus. So you've got to hold these three things together. And um, uh, that's what he does. He's a great storyteller. He's a great historian, Luke the Gospel writer, but he's also a great theologian. He wants us to know God and his son Jesus. Now, if you've got your Bibles open, let's do a little class activity. Okay, chapter 1, verse 5. Have you got your Bibles there? Let me show you this triangle in action. Chapter 1, verse 5. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blameless in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and both were advanced in years. Now, three verses only. Could you see the narrative, the history and the theology in those verses? Okay, what's the history? Herod. Okay, in the days of Herod, king of Judea. A real historical figure. Okay, history. What's the um, narrative? What's, what's an example of the narrative in those three verses? What's an example of the narrative? Zechariah and Elizabeth cannot have children. Zechariah and Elizabeth um, can't have children and she's barren, okay? And uh, they long to have a child, okay? That's narrative. What about the theology? Can you see the theology in it yet? Now, it's a bit more subtle, the theology. The history, the story... And wherever you see the name Lord, 
okay? That's a really good indicator of where the theology is. So Zechariah and Elizabeth are walking with the Lord, okay? So these are godly characters that we're encountering in Luke's story, okay? Now, as you move through the um, gospel, that synthesis of narrative history and theology becomes like a snowball. You know that when, when you, well, maybe not in Australia with snowballs, but you know how you get some pastry, right? <laughs> you get some pastry in the kitchen and you roll it and you roll it and roll it, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger as you're rolling it along. Got it? All right, some dough. Well, it's like that with these things in Luke's gospel. As you move through, you see the narrative gets bigger. The history becomes more evident and the theological truths become more prominent. So have a look at verse 10. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. That's narrative. But what are they praying about? What are they praying about? At 8 o'clock, let me tell you what they said at 8 o'clock. Someone said that they're praying that Israel would be saved from the Romans. Possibly. Someone said that they're praying for forgiveness. Highly likely, because that's what the temple was there for, for the atonement of sin. Okay? They're praying for forgiveness, no doubt. They're praying for the salvation of Israel, praying for the f redemption of Israel. Uh, possibly even as specific as praying for the Messiah. Notice verse 20. And behold, you'll be silent and unable to speak, the angel says to um, Zechariah, until the day that these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. And so there you have the, the theology becoming more prominent. Jesus, okay, is going to be the fulfilment of these things that God has promised. God is making promises and John and Jesus are going to be fulfilments of that. So as we move through Luke's gospel in coming weeks, I want you to keep that triangle in your mind, okay? Because all of it works together. If you get rid of any part of that triangle, then the Gospel of Luke loses its power, okay? Because Luke is trying to engage you with a story that is true and that has something to say about God and his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, so that we might have certainty about the things that we have been taught. Now, during uh, Connect 09, uh, this essential Jesus was circulated and uh, we've got... Uh, up-to-date copies of this Luke's Gospel available for anyone who wishes to take one to give to a, a family member or friend. Not only has it got a great translation of Luke's Gospel, but it's also got a little introduction about what comes before Luke's Gospel at the front. It's got a two ways to live explanation of the Christian faith at the back, plus one or two testimonies about people who've come to faith in the Lord Jesus. It's a great little giveaway resource or to sit down with someone uh, to read Luke's Gospel with. And so if you'd like a copy of that, uh, just see Meryl at the end of our service. Don't take one if you can't use it, but if you can use it, Meryl will have copies and we'd love you to have one of these. But remember that Luke wants us to have certainty about the things that we have been taught about Jesus, the Son of God. Well, we're going to sing again. Our musicians are coming up and uh, we're going to sing about living the Christian life, a life of um, dedication to the Saviour. So please stand as our musicians lead us.